Good morning. I'm Ali Zakri Alias from the ICLIF Leadership and Governance Center. Today with us in the leaders' room, we have a very special individual and guest who needs little to no introduction. In 1999, she and a group of like fellow individuals set up Mercy Malaysia, and this was after she had observed the atrocities committed in the Kosovo War. She has won many numerous awards, such as the inaugural East Asian Women's Peace Award from the Philippines, the Gandhi King and Aikida Award from the USA, and recently, the recipient of the first Bahrain ISA Award for Service to Humanity. We welcome today Tansri Dr. Jamila Mahmoud. Tansri, good morning and good morning. welcome. Tansri, for our first question, it was reported that the Kosovo War triggered your first realization of epiphany of humanitarian and medical aid in crisis. Can you share with us if the event was a sudden jolt from the blue that you experienced, or was it something that you had always felt and that the event was simply the tipping point in your realization? Well, I think it was the tipping point. Um, ever since I joined the medical career or entered medical school, it was always you know, about the greater good of medicine. Uh, along the way, you, know, you get caught up with uh, the paper chase. Yes. Uh, you know, your career in, uh, it has to be linear or up, up growing and it has to be following a certain pattern, otherwise you fall back on your promotions. Yes. So you, you, know, you don't get to realise uh, there are no incentives for, for doing this. I think the you know, Kosovo was a time when I was already in private practice. I was no longer dependent on anyone el else except myself to raise my own salary, um, and I thought that was right. But you know, it was a, a time of real uh, searching for me as well. And my son, yes. uh, who was five at the time, I was complaining to him, watching television, and saying, you know, there was war and all these people suffering, you have to be very grateful. Yes. And of course, he turned around, looked at me and says, well, you're a doctor, why aren't you doing anything about it? And that's, you know, that kind of said, yeah, that's it. That was the last trigger that ne I needed. And so was there a feeling of like, this was the right decision to make? Or? You know, you make a decision. You're never really sure whether it's the right decision, but yes. that's about, you know, decision making. You have to make a decision. I think the longer you put it off, yes. you, you never get to where you want to be and you just keep complaining. Yes. Tansri, just moving on a bit more, what were the influences that helped shape you into becoming a humanitarian and also a leader as such? Well, first of all, I think it's my family background. Uh, I come from a very diverse family, a multi multi-racial, a lot of mixed marriages. Yes. My own parents were of different ethnicity. Um, and I was very troubled by what I was seeing in Malaysia and outside Malaysia about how people couldn't use diversity as a strength and, and how ethnic tensions had led to war and so forth. And humanitarianism is about independence, impartiality, and neutrality. Mm. And I think that's the only platform one can bring people to do good on, mm. on a very, very clear goal that is about serving the needs of people irrespective of their race, religion, culture, creed. Mm. And you know, and, and I think, you know, that was really the main impetus of a family growing up diverse, also a very charitable family mm. and a school background in Asunta where you know, we were always uh, told that, you know, educate your hearts, your minds will follow. Mm. And as you know, with missionary schools, it's always about helping other people, yes. charity drives and so forth. It was really ingrained into me, even from a very young age. Yes. So do you think to be a humanitarian, is it nature or nurture? I think, first of all, um, the whole concept of humanitarianism is not like some angelic person trying to do yes. this. I think I like to dispel that kind of notion. As I said, humanitarianism is a professional uh, decision about how you work with people affected by crisis, whether it's disasters or, or conflict or whatever. Mm. But um, you know, it's leadership is required in humanitarianism just as it's required in the business sector. The only difference is this: your clients in the private sector have power yes. because they can choose whether to come to you or not. In the humanitarian sector, you're dealing with clients that have less power than you. Now the good humanitarian will make sure that the client who is the affected population is able to exert its power mm. and, that, and that the humanitarian is able to give away power to make sure that communities will actually take leadership in what they need. 
I think that's a good humanitarian. Un unfortunately, it's lacking. Yes. A lot of humanitarians feel they can just come in on their, you know, high horses and try and tell and impose what they think is required for people yeah. rather than the other way around. Yeah. And do you think that hum being a humanitarian is only confined in the areas of like an NGO or could we actually see these values of humanitarianism is it even in corporate world and the corporate sector itself? Well because the humanitarian principles are embedded in impartiality, independence and neutrality, yes. I guess you know if you are able to uh, you know offer assistance or support in a way that, that, that holds on to these critical values and principles then you know anyone can actually do it. I mean I was a medical doctor, I wasn't yes. trained to be a humanitarian uh, I have people in, you know, who came along with me who were teachers, who were lawyers, who were engineers. They weren't trained to be humanitarians, but they held on to those principles. And, of course, the, the bottom line is you have to have a, a population who are affected by crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do voluntary work and, you know, good deeds in and around communities, mm -hmm. but if the communities don't have the power imbalance and the and the crisis that they are in, then it doesn't become humanitarian. It just becomes voluntarism and do good. Right, right. Yeah, right. But it's also very important. Yes, yeah. yes. You mentioned about, you know, people from diverse backgrounds mm -hmm. actually coming to, to, yeah. to you and and you are also leading them into, into these areas, which yeah. is sometimes quite personally dangerous also. Yeah. How would you describe the leadership style in managing a whole group of volunteers? You know, people who who have different backgrounds, mm. different trainings, different objectives maybe, I'm mm. not sure. So mm. would it be something very different from a typical leadership situation? Well, I think what I did was, first of all, looked at everyone as being able to offer something. Yeah. And the best thing to do is to listen and observe and figure out what do they best contribute. We cannot expect to have a cookie cutter mold yes. to say everyone must be able to do this. Yes. Or has to be able to perform in this way. I mean, I have skills as a doctor. I have yes. skills as maybe a leadership skill to bring people together, good people together. But I don't know how to design uh, townships or to build buildings or to set up educational programs. Mm. So I use the, the strength that is within the team. So I guess it's about respect, which is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at everyone as equal, that doctors are no better than you know, lawyers or, or teachers or housewives yes. even who came to, to join us and to then figure out where you extract the best out of each yes. and then, you know, bringing people towards a common goal. I think that's very, very, very important to keep focus on bringing people towards a common goal. All right. In fact, this common goal, in most organisations or corporations, there is that five-year plan, three-year plan, ten-year yeah. plan and it's very definable in terms yeah. of what organisation wants to achieve. Yeah. In your case, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's about uh, addressing the ills of the world. Mm -hmm. How do you motivate yourself, keep yourself going, keep your team going, yeah. knowing that this might actually be a never-ending task in that sense? You know, you take one thing at a time, but the important thing is when I was in the leadership of Western Malaysia, for example, yes. I made sure that we fulfilled all the criteria of any international ben benchmark yes. of good standards in humanitarianism. Therefore, you know, taking our organization through certification yes. for humanitarian accountability, uh, you know, making sure that there is a quality management system on board, which yes. means that it's about not just a one-off thing, it was also about learning and improving. Mm. Because I think that culture is very important, to, to not think that what you do today is relevant next year. It may change. Situations change. So it's about living in the moment. Of, in it's not just living in the moment, but making sure that at least you meet, you make sure you meet all the criteria that's required, the benchmarks that are set, and how you perform. Yes. And try to excel that. Yes. And then you know, also making being honest to yourself to say that what didn't work, yes. didn't work, and therefore don't try to repeat that in another setting. And yes. also being very contextual because. Different populations, different governments all behave differently. Mm. So you can't just go into a country and think that you're going to change the world. You can't. It's about partnership. Mm. It's about making sure that everybody else does their part so that the end result is going to be something very positive. Mm. Actually, uh, Tansri, I'm quite intrigued to also find out from you. What, is, what was your thoughts about making a decision to go on a global platform as opposed mm. to hey, you know what, there's so many things to do even on the local front. Mm. Why not do the local front first and build your way out as opposed to let's go and uh, you know, go on the global platform? How, can you share with us yeah. your thoughts? 
Well, then again, it comes to my first, uh, you know, d differentiation between humanitarianism and doing good okay. and doing charity. Humanitarianism shouldn't be about charity. It's about rights. Yeah. It's about making sure that people have a right to live with dignity. I saw Malaysia growing and developing, and, you know, the benchmarks for our growth were very much dependent on our, you know, income per capita. Yes. It was very materialistic financial goals and, you know, there were some minimum development goals, of yes. obviously, about poverty eradication, which yes. was really important. But I felt one thing that was missing was, you know, how do we make sure Malaysians look at development, at development as also people being developed to have compassion, mm -hmm. to be able to look at themselves as being leaders for other people as well. Mm -hmm. So why can't Malaysia... And I was really, really tired of turning on the television and every time you look at a crisis, it was always a, a Western face. There was no Asian, there was no, um, you know, n nobody from the global south, so to speak, or non-Western. Yes. And here we are saying that we're very caring and, you know, all our religions expound being good and virtuous and being charitable. Where are we? We are invisible. So I wanted so badly to create this platform, uh, one, for nation building as well, yes. to bring all the different popula you know, parts of Malaysia together on a common platform of doing good. And then, you know, making a mark internationally to say, we can do it in our own way as well. We don't need to bring entirely Western values yes. into humanitarianism. Yes. You know, Malaysia is so diverse. We've been able to live with each other because it's all about tolerance, giving, taking, trying to understand each other's cultures. And I think that was really missing in the whole humanitarian arena. People mm. would come in and, and, and impose mm. their own cultures and their values on other people. So, you know, why can't we? I mean, why can't I, you know, I felt that. Why can't I position development in Malaysia as about doing things beyond our shores? Mm. Um, and I was very determined to do that. But what sustained you? I mean... You know, you are going, you, you're not even starting from ground, ground zero, you're going from ground zero to ground <laughs> ten. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm sure you must have faced a lot of challenges, yeah. the sheer impossibility at yeah. that point of time of setting something up. What, what kept you going? What kept on saying, no, I'm going to, to, to achieve it? Well, I think, I guess in some ways, you need to really be clear why you want to do it. So the conviction was very important internally for me. I guess I had a very strong faith and I felt that, you know, this is what I need to do uh, as a good person. This is part and parcel of my faith to help others that are, you know, in, in a more worse off position than me and to be able to also demonstrate that my faith doesn't discriminate between races and religions. The third thing, I guess, was also um, the fact that you can try and you can fail or not try and always feel that you never tried. Mm. So I chose to try and if I fail, then it's one up for experience. I'll know what to do next. Mm. But sitting back and feeling that I needed to do something and not doing anything, I think would have made me even more, you know, a worse off person because... I had all that energy and that passion. I needed to try it out. And of course, when I tried it out, I realized that, gosh, we brought a completely different way of doing things compared to other humanitarian organizations in the West. Yes. And it was a mere satisfaction of seeing people look at us and saying, you're from Malaysia. We, we all admire Malaysia. You know, we, we want to learn from Malaysians. You are the model country for us. You know, people don't realize this. I think Malaysians don't realize how much Malaysia is respected in the global south. Mm. And, you know, then the, you, you can build relationships so easily and you see change. Mm. And I think that motivated me. It wasn't about having, you know, the highest funds in the organization compared mm. to other. We could never compete with the big yes. organizations of the world. But we made more difference, I guess, and impact to people's lives yes. by being who we were. Yes. Did you ever think that you would fail? Of course, you always think that you might fail, but you know, failure is not a bad thing. Failure, you know, comes with its lessons as well and its learnings. And I, and I think that people who are afraid to fail can never be real leaders. Absolutely, absolutely. Tanshi, if I can just talk about sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Did you think about that? Because you knew you were going, you were going to be a world beater in that sense. Mm. But that would also require a price to be paid. How did you manage to 
to, to, to come to terms or handle it or manage, manage the sacrifices that you would have to make? You know, the biggest sacrifice I made was really time with my family. Yes. Uh, that's the biggest sacrifice. And the second biggest sacrifice was, you know, I gave up my very lucrative medical career. Yes. You know, many people don't realize this, that entire time I was in Mercy Malaysia, I didn't take a single cent of salary. Um, I didn't feel it was right because I established the organization and I just didn't want any perceptions that, you know, I established it to raise money for myself because I could have done that in my practice. So. There's two big sacrifices I had to make but, I make, but I think the biggest one obviously was time with my family. And, you know, that's hard, you know, and it required a lot of conversations within the family. And, you know, I had young children then. Yes. But you know, my kids, you know, kind of understand. I think they're very proud of me. You know, my whole family uh, are probably my number one supporters. You know, every time I feel, oh, this is too much, I can't do this anymore, you know, they would be the ones who say, come on, you have to do it, you can do it, you know, we can't, you can do it, you know, go ahead and we'll give you all the support. And I think that's, that's been a great strength for me, having support, you know, from my closest people around me, my, my family, my children. Um, and, you know, and, and realising that in life, you know, you, life is just so unpredictable. Yes. You can be... Everything can be snatched away for you in, from you in a moment, yes. but you know if you can negotiate all the difficulties and have those difficult conversations and, and come to a common understanding that you know here's what I'm good at and do you think that's a good thing for me to do and get the okay, complete support, then I think you know just go go for it. Okay. Yeah. Through through one of the, the the videos that we were watching that well when I was watching that three and you had mentioned that your mother had mentioned to you that you were different. <laughs> Did you yeah. ever feel that you were different or you were destined to be a leader or there's a sense of destiny to it from, from, from young? You know, I like leading. I wouldn't lie about it. Uh, when I was in school, um, I was always the president of something or you know, secretary of another organisation. I always liked leadership roles because mm. I felt, you know, I've, I, I really like bringing people together and you know just it's leading i like communicating mm. um i like to see things being shaped and success you know, success coming out of it mm. so i guess in many ways you know i i really liked being a leader in the family i'm actually the youngest of all my siblings we have a very large family um and my father died very young uh, um, or rather my father died when i was very young and my mother had to go to work yes. <clears throat> and to bring us all up. And uh, and she had to, she gave me all sorts of different tasks. Like I was responsible to make sure that some of the family members of my father in Singapore had, you know, school books and school shoes yes. and stuff. You know, and I was 14 years old and yes. I couldn't understand why she was doing this. But I guess, you know, mothers always know about their children and, you know, what, what they're like and she must have observed me to be different from everybody else and I think she shaped me as well and helped me you know become what I am today yes. and she was a leader herself you know she was an entrepreneur and she was you know very very hard working yes. and you know she always told us nothing comes easy everything is with hard work yes. um, so you know I guess the short of it is yes I think you know my leadership mold was created from young, you know, from, from home, uh, from my teenage years, and then school, in university, I was always trying to lead something or be a part of a leadership movement. Yes. And, uh, and therefore, it kind of, you know, I guess it comes naturally to me. But I also believe you can create leaders. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, in my time, for example, with Mercy Malaysia, I've always made sure that some of the younger ones or you know, people who work with me would go out and become leaders themselves mm -hmm. and, and try to push that. And, you know, and, and leadership requires mentorship and, and sponsorship. Yes. So I'm very lucky because I have a group of mentors who really care about me, who, who are willing to, to tell me what I may not want to hear. And I surround myself with these people. I don't surround myself with people who will tell me how good I am. Mm. You know, you can get that easily, but it's much more difficult to get real friends who will actually tell you when you're not doing so well, mm. or why you're not doing so well, or to tell you when they think you might be behaving, you know, not the right way or whatever. Mm. 
and, and, and the other group, of course, is sponsorship. So to find people who really believe in your cause and give you a push. And, and you know, I was very fortunate in my life that I've always been able to find those people. Yes. And, you know, and now, you know, trying to also do the same with the younger generation. Yes. What's the qualities to be a sponsor in that sense, you know? Because nowadays it's not that, that, that easy to find mm. somebody who actually gels also with you. And also sometimes I think there are leaders out there who actually want to, to become sponsors and want to become mentors. What's the secret and ingredient to being a successful mentor or sponsor? You have to really be sincere. It's timely. It takes a lot of time to be a mentor. You know, it's, it's about putting aside time to certain people to say, I'm going to mentor these people and I'm going to make sure I spend X amount of hours a month to sit down and just listen or whatever. And mentorship doesn't mean, you know, you, you give them connections. No, yeah, yeah. it's about really giving time for them themselves to develop as, as human beings, as leaders. And in sponsorship, it's about really believing in the cause and, and fighting for, you know, for the person who you're trying to sponsor to be moved up or to, to be given that opportunity to do something. Yes. Yeah. And How did you do it then? I mean, during the time, where, especially during uh, Mercy Malaysia, where I'm sure crises were happening mm. all the time. And you're also running an organization mm. and you're raising funds and you yourself are getting involved on mm. the ground. How do you manage to find the time to do the sponsorship and mentorship? You can do it, you know, while I'm on the ground. Where, you know, I go to the field a lot. I brought young people out and I spent time with them. They looked at me, you know, if they slept on in the tent on the floor, I slept in the tent on the floor with yes. them. And, you know, leadership has also got to be about example and walking the talk. Um, and then, you know, just spending time to talk. You know, I talk a lot to my, my younger, mm. you know, volunteers and so forth. I listen to them. I give them advice, um, you know, I sometimes, you know, will tell them that you know, this is not the right thing to do, maybe you can try something else. Uh, and then, you know, making the time, I, I, I don't know how to, I guess, because I don't sleep that much, therefore I have a lot of time to, to catch up with their emails or yes. their you know, phone calls. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's why I built this platform. It wasn't about me. It was building a platform for other people to do good and to take on the leadership when the time comes. And 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 how do you identify for you in, in your in your sense for succession planning yeah. in, in terms to, to take on your men, uh, mental? What are the qualities that you look for? Well, I I think it's very hard. Succession planning, I must say, is probably the hardest thing to do because you cannot find someone who's exactly like you. Yes. And you shouldn't. Yes. Because good organizations become better when you get leadership to transform it and to take it to a different level. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I knew the risk of me staying too long in Mercy Malaysia was that people could no longer put Mercy Malaysia and me apart. Mm. It would always, always be synonymous. And at the point that I was approaching my 10th year, I realized that it was more critical for me to do that. Um, and I then tested out, you know, a couple of people and, you know, allowed them to take on, I took a sabbatical leave so that they would actually run the organization. Um, and then, you know, make the decision that it has to be at a very critical point, 10th year, that's when you leave, you know. Um, and it's hard when you founded something uh, and it's like your child. And you're not going to give it away to someone else to take care of it. Yes. And uh, I, you know, the decision then, that's when I left, I left. I don't hold any link to the organization at all. Um, so that, you know, if the organization wants to change the way it works or what it wants to focus on, I shouldn't be the one to be a hurdle or a barrier to that change. Yes. So, you know, <laughs> I guess it's, it's about... A commitment to change, to succession, um, holding yourself true to that commitment for succession and then when the time comes to walk away. So, but how do you resist it from, I'm sure you read about it in mm. newspapers and I'm sure sometimes it must flash through your mind that I would have done it differently. Yeah. How, how, how do you manage yourself in, in those sort of situations? You just try not to put your head into the organization's matters. I stay away from from the organization as much as I can. If people ask me, I direct them to 
the mm. new leadership. And you know, if I want to know anything, I just go on the website and have a look. Uh, but I don't, I don't do anything. But I think something very important that I want to share is that when the tenth year was coming, you know, I prayed really hard. I said, you know, is this the right thing to do? Give me a sign, you know, like is this organization going to just be destroyed and then yes. therefore my platform is no more there. Yes. Um, and then some very strange things happened. I was in a, in a meeting in Geneva and I was standing in front of a, of the United Nations building and just watching you know, the palais and a bunch of women came up to me and they were Sudanese and they saw me and said, um, are you Malaysian? And I like, Yes, you know, and I said, oh, you're Sudanese. Said, yeah, yeah, I've started talking. And she said, well, do you know this organization called Mercy Malaysia? And I, th I thought it was a very bizarre question. So I said, yes, you know, why? And she said, well, I'm from Darfur. And I said, well, I know Darfur. I used to work there. And she said, oh, well, the Mercy Malaysia came and they built this, you know, women's health center and trained the staff there so that women now have a place, a safe place to give birth. And that was actually my idea, and I, you know, led the, that decision. And then she looked at me and she says, but do you know Dr. Jamila? And I was like, yes. And I said, why? You know, and she said, well, here's my card. Please tell her that the women in Darfur will wait for her to come. And, you know, that women don't have to die in childbirth anymore. And, you know, I just, you know, I gave her my card. She went hysterical. I ran away and just broke down and cried <laughs> because I thought, you know, how many times in your life do you get unsolicited feedback yes. and really, you know, verification for what you thought was a decision you made and the work that you do. And, and that wasn't the first thing that happened. Three things happened in a row. Three completely different countries verified the work that I did. And... You know, after the third one, I just wrote my resignation letter and said goodbye, everyone. You know, I'm leaving. I gave them two months' notice and took the first job offered to me as far away from Malaysia as possible and left. Wow. Yeah. That's true. It's easy to look back and yeah. look at all the accomplishments. Yeah. But when a person is going through the process, there's a lot of pain involved. And yeah, I yeah. think in your case, it's literal also. Yeah. You were shot in the hip. Mm -hmm. You You just... You didn't go for an operation. All you did was you just closed up the wound. You continued working for five days. Mm, so, yeah, more. <laughs> and you only got the surgery when you came back to Malaysia. Yeah. Now, in most normal people's case, they would be sobbing on the floor, not being able to do anything. Yeah. And how would, how, what, what powered you through yeah. those periods of pain and just being able to get your objective done? Believe me, I sobbed. I didn't sob for myself. I sobbed for uh, my colleague who was also injured and I sobbed for my driver who was killed. And, you know, I felt so angry with myself, so upset and I uh, blamed myself really that, you know, was it my wrong decision? You know, worked through the whole security protocol in my head mm. the entire time and realised we didn't make a mistake. It was just one of those things that happens, you know, the UN was stormed in Somalia two days ago and they lost so many staff. People just came in and shot them, you know. And these things happen. These are the risks with humanitarianism. But, you know, the, the bullet wound, to be very honest, I didn't even notice I had been hit until someone pointed to me that I was bleeding. And, you know, I saw this hole in my jacket and I realised, uh-oh, you know, there's a problem here. And there were no doctors at that time where I went to this hospital and, you know, literally got someone to hold my pants down where I started trying to close this hole and you know and then of course I felt pain after that you know the shock and everything but I was in this hospital we moved deeper into a trouble area because we needed to get my friend to a hospital that had a blood bank and an operating theater and I needed to take him to theater mm. and you know the strangest thing has happened again uh, that as I was resting and thinking, you know, feeling a little bit sorry for myself, you know, how do I get myself into this situation? The door knocked and, you know, a nurse comes in and says, you know, we have a woman in labor and she's, she's very anemic. And she requires a caesarean section. She's had two previous caesareans and you're the most experienced doctor in this hospital right now. And so I had to go into theater and, you know, literally help get this baby delivered. And at the end of it, I, you know, I again felt very sad because there was a lot of pain. And I said, you know, I'll come and see her in six hours to see how she's doing. 
And I walked back to the room, you know, and she was sitting up in bed. And I thought, no, this can't be the same woman that I operated. And they said, yes. And I said to her, you're crazy. You just had major surgery six hours ago. Why are you sitting up in bed, folding her clothes? And she said, I want to go home because if the bombs drop tonight on my family and my children, I want to be there. And I thought, you know what? My pain is nothing. I know what it's like to have major surgery. And I looked at her and I said, you know, here's a woman of courage. I'm not courageous. I just, you know, am part and parcel of the whole equation of why I'm there. You know, there must be a reason why I got shot and landed in that hospital to do surgery for this woman and for this woman to reaffirm to me that, you know what, it does come with risks. Yes. And, uh, you know, so I gave her all my painkillers and I thought I'll never complain again. And I continued working for the next five days. And, you know, when a bullet gets into you, it's sterile. The speed that a bullet gets into you, the heat generated yes. around it, it's remained sterile until, you know, it hits something nasty. <laughs> and I was very lucky because, you know, I managed to keep it stabilised wow. and then had the surgery back, yeah. Katri, yeah. you mentioned about risk. Mm. And in most leaders' uh, daily lives, it's about taking risks. Yeah. How do you go about taking that decision? Because the decisions that you made, you, you made during that time mm. especially, literally could involve lives yeah. too. Yeah. What were the process uh, did you go through? It's calculated risks. Uh, there, there are, for example, in security, there are um, ways that you calculate risk uh, in humanitarian work. Yes. There are security levels. And, um, and then you communicate. You know, I communicated with everyone from the American Command Control to you know, some of the local leaders that we were coming in. I've worked in many, many difficult areas. Yes. Um, and, and therefore, making that you know, collective calculated risk and then adjusting it as and when you see required. You know, when we were there, initially, it was fine. We were working mm. in the hospital and the, the person who took us to the next hospital was saying, you know, I do this trip three times a day and we cleared the security and everything and we went. It just so happened that, you know, there was a big, small clash in the villages and there was crossfire when we were passing through with the ambulance. Mm. So, you know, it's making calculated risks. Mm. Um, but, you know, now that that happened, what happened was, and when we returned, was we escalated our security level training so that we would be, be more stringent in how we use, uh, you know, security yes. assessments. And uh, I also built in, you know, thinking about how do you use community risk mechanisms as well and, you know, making communities more aware of our presence so that they was, would be the ones protecting us as well. Yes. So, you know, it, it, risk cannot be just out of the blue. Risk management is about really making conscious decisions and yes. you have to be well informed to make yes. those conscious decisions. So it's gathering of information, knowledge, you know, and, and the tools that are required to make those decisions. Yes. And uh, Tanshri, how do you manage yourself when mm. things go when things go wrong? So how do you do you beat you know some people beat themselves over their heads and how do you manage yourself? I think I do a little bit of each. I beat myself on the head for a little while, you know, and then I I I try to rationalize and I take time out to kind of really reflect and think and pray, whatever, to, to really get, you know, really get grounded into myself. And then, you know, and then I come out of it and say, okay, you know, that's it. Uh, we move forward, you know, all the time. I think I'm an incurable optimist. This is the problem. Mm. Um, I always feel that everything happens for a reason, good or bad. And it's going to make me become a better person, you know, with every experience. Mm. It makes me a better leader after ex every experience. So... You know, I, I take a very positive approach to whether I've made a mistake or whether, you know, I've done something really great. And you know, a mistake is not a mistake till you commit it twice, right? I mean, they always say an error <laughs> doesn't become a mistake till you keep repeating it. So, I hope I committed more errors than mistakes. You know, right. than, yeah. Right. Right. Tanshree, I have to ask you this question: As a woman, mm -hmm. has your gender ever been a? Um, uh, a barrier to getting your work done or has it actually been an impetus for you to get your work done? My gender has been one of the strongest reasons why I think I've succeeded. Um, I am a woman, I'm not ashamed of it and I'm a, I use my feminism and in a way that's very positive. I think that 
You know, people always, that I, I have issues with women who try to be like men when they mm. lead. Whereas I use, you know, all my femi you know, feminine values as a woman who, you know, by nature is caring, who's gentle and who's able to communicate. And, and I use that. And now in the situations that I work, there are many countries that I go to that will not allow men access to women. I get access to these women. When I get access to these women, I get to understand how they live, how they function as family units. I get into their homes. Um, and I get a better perspective, you know, with a, a better cultural lens and a better gender understanding. And that helps me actually, you know, program things in a way that will be much more culturally acceptable. And I get to also be their advocates, you know, because I, I bring their voice uh, to the forefront. So, you know, I really think uh, women uh, must take their f femininity as a real plus um, and not try to be like men. Mm. We're not, we can never be the same. We're very different, you know, genetically and in the way we think, in the way we are wired up and so forth. Tantri, you have two sons? I have two sons. If you were to have a daughter, what mm -hmm. advice would you actually give her? I would advise her the same advice that I give my two sons. Whatever you do in life, success can never be measured only in dollars and cents. It's about what impact have you left you know, in the world when you leave. How would you like to be remembered by? So I would tell her to chase her dreams, no matter what it was, whether society looked at it as something strange or different. Um, and, and to have confidence, yeah. And would that advice be the same for our leaders in the corporate world or in any other organisation? Yes, I think, you know, especially corporate leaders, they have so much opportunity to do more good than me. You know, a lot of the things that the corporations do can really change lives. Um, I don't believe that lives are changed because people come in to assist them. That's certainly not how I work. It's always about making communities stronger than when we found them, to make sure they find the solutions. And it always has, in the end, to deal with being able to be able to stand on their own feet. And that requires earning money and you know livelihoods and so forth. Now, the corporations have a lot of power to do that. Yes. And what I would like corporate leaders to do is, again, to think about how would you like to be remembered? What have you left? as a mark in the world when you're gone. Tantri, final question for you. Mm. You have achieved so much already. What's next for you and what next can we mm. expect from you? Well, I always feel now in this phase of my life, it's a time for me to play a different role. Um, I am doing a lot of uh, work, uh, sitting on many international boards, trying to influence large organizations, big donors on how they can best you know, do their work and really looking at governance as a very important issue yes. because I take that very seriously. Yes. And also I think um, my big dream, which I hope I can realize, especially with the prize that I've just got, is to set up a center that will look at you know, new models on how we look at humanitarianism, uh, how do we look at conflict resolution and peace building and I think you know that will be you know the next phase in my life. And I think I I want to play a greater role now in developing new leaders uh, in this sector. I also want to uh, play a role in uh, supporting governments and leaders in how they can make better decisions and how they can engage with other actors, especially in conflict and peace and you know resolution. And uh, at some point in my life, I need to start writing my memoirs, you know, and my stories because I think, you know, I don't think that I'm a great person. I really don't. I think I'm just a normal, ordinary human being that's been the, given the opportunity to do some very extraordinary things. Um, but along with that comes a lot of stories, some very funny uh, and some, you know, very sad. And I think I would like to leave those behind, you know, for my children, for the next generation that, you know, they need to also tell their own stories at some point. Thank you very much, Tantri, for sharing with us your experiences and very inspiring stories. This is Ali Zakri Alias, and I'm signing off from the Leaders Room. <laughs>